Get three months of local news for just 99 cents a month. You'll get unlimited access to the news you need to stay engaged and connected to your community. Visit DuluthNewsTribune.com slash subscribe now to get three months of local news for only 99 cents a month. Hello, Northlanders. It's Tuesday, August 6th. I'm Wyatt Buckner with your Duluth News Tribune Minute, presented by Minnesota Power Employees Credit Union. The average MPECU member saves over $785 a year in better rates and lower fees. And with MPECU, every ATM is your ATM. With their free checking program, you get ATM fee reimbursements at any ATM anywhere in the U.S. Check out Minnesota Power Employees Credit Union services online at mpecu.com or visit their offices in downtown Duluth, Arrowhead Road, or Miller Trunk Highway. Now here's a look at today's headlines. A fish kill in Tisher Creek last week occurred after the city of Duluth reported a release of up to 500,000 gallons of water from one of its reservoirs, the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency said. The MPCA said more than 1,000 fish, including hundreds of brook trout, were found dead in the creek, which runs through Hartley Park and the Hunters Park neighborhood before cascading down the hill and emptying into Lake Superior near the grounds of the Glensheen Mansion. The fish kill was discovered on the morning of Thursday, August 1st, and areas hit hardest appear to be downstream of a culvert near Hartley Park, with no apparent impacts upstream of the culvert, the News Tribune reported last week. The MPCA and the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources are analyzing fish and water samples to determine the cause, the MPCA said. Quote, evidence indicates that this fish kill likely did not occur naturally, end quote, the MPCA said. The city of Duluth reported the water release to the Minnesota duty officer, and the fish kill was observed after that, the MPCA said. A spokesperson for the city did not immediately respond to the News Tribune's request for comment on Monday. While some neighbors last week wondered if Woodland Avenue construction or bridge construction project and stream diversion where the creek crosses under West St. Andrews Street were to blame, the MPCA said it has no evidence connecting the construction to the fish kill. A 55-year-old Iron Range man was sentenced to more than 46 years in prison Monday after pleading guilty to two counts of second-degree intentional murder for killing an elderly Babbitt couple who took him in. Roger Allen Beldo confessed to striking Clifford Leonard Johnson in the head with a tire iron while his 78-year-old host was in a garage at his residence last October. He then proceeded to enter the home, where Beldo acknowledged attacking Christine Lewis Johnson, 79, with a hammer, causing her death. A granddaughter of the Johnsons told authorities that Beldo had been residing in the Babbitt home for at least a month before the attack. Judge Michelle Anderson told Beldo that while he had accepted responsibility for murdering the Johnsons, the quote, gruesome facts, end quote, of the case demands serious consequences. She referred to the brutal murders as two separate, senseless acts that compound the seriousness of the crimes. When asked if he wanted to make a statement prior to sentencing, Beldo responded succinctly, offering little defense, saying he loved the elderly couple and that they were good to him. As part of a plea deal, Beldo will not face charges of first-degree premeditated murder. Convictions on those charges would have each carried mandatory life sentences without the possibility of parole. Under the terms of a plea agreement, Beldo was sentenced to serve 556 months in prison. In effect, however, the deal may mean he never leaves confinement again, with the convict ineligible for supervised release until his mid-80s at the earliest. Beldo will turn 56 this week, and Anderson said he will serve the next 30 years in prison. Beldo has remained in jail since his arrest, unable to post a $1 million bail or bond note. For a preview of an upcoming story, Dan Williamson joins us now with a special guest. Thank you very much, Wyatt. I'm joined by one of our colleagues, Jay Gabler, Duluth News to be an arts and entertainment reporter. And Jay has a story that we'll be able to read in Wednesday's print edition of the Duluth News Tribune. It's also a story that you can find on our website before that at DuluthNewsTribune.com. Jay, you were telling me this story is about a new art form that's going to be involved with a local classical music festival. What more can you tell us? That's right. Dan, this is the upcoming Duluth Chamber Music Festival. This is the third annual occurrence of that festival. It's taking place next week, Monday, August 12th, culminating with a concert on Thursday, August 15th at UMD. So as the previous two years, there will be chamber music performed as part of this festival, locations across Duluth. But what's new this year 
is the addition of live original dance. Brianna Crockett, who is a member of Minnesota Ballet, is choreographing and performing three original dance pieces to be performed with some of the music that will be performed at this festival. Very cool. Is there anything in particular you learned in covering this story? Well, you know, Dan, it's always so cool as a journalist when you are trusted by artists to come into their space, to talk with them, hear about their process, and to experience their work maybe before it's ready for the public or before the public had been able to take it in. And it was just so cool to go to the Minnesota Ballet Studios and talk to Brianna about the dances that she's creating and see previews of a couple of them, which I just sort of mentioned briefly in the feature. No spoilers, right? Well, it's ballet. You, you know generally what it looks like, but these dances are really uh, delightful and again, completely original, choreographed by Brianna. And in the feature, you can see some of the great photos that Wyatt took, as well as one that he didn't originally include in the edit of this story, but I'm like, Wyatt, You've got to put a photo of the puppy in there. She brought her adorable little dog to uh, rehearsal with her. And Wyatt has a really cute picture of Brianna with her dog. I'm surprised Wyatt didn't get that in there right away. Wyatt loves dogs, as we all do. But good on you, Jay, for getting on Wyatt about that. As far as our audience goes, what do you hope they take from this story? I hope they learn a little bit more about music about dance and about the trust that's required among these collaborators. Basically, these musicians who are part of the Duluth Chamber Music Festival, they're coming from out of town. That's kind of how this festival was developed is that they had a friend in town, a mutual friend in town. They would come and stay with their friend and would sort of play private performances. And eventually their friend who was a Duluthian said, listen, you should do this publicly, right? You're going to play this incredible music. It should you know, be open to the public. And so that's how they decided to found the Duluth Chamber Music Festival. And they knew Brianna. She had been coming to the musical performances, but you know they're not going to have a chance to see these dance pieces before the performances take place. Basically, they put their trust in Brianna and said, you know, please, you know, do us the honor of creating these dances. And when we all come together in Duluth in August, you know, you'll premiere these dances and we will play the music live. She's been doing the choreography to recordings of the music. And You know, we will all just sort of take a trust fall together and bring the dance and the music together in live performance for Duluth audiences. And I just thought that was so cool that these artists are having that trust in each other and are so excited about adding this new dimension to this live music festival. Excellent. Great stuff as always, Jay. Thank you so much for your time. Yeah, thanks, Dan. And again, you can read Jay's article in Wednesday's print edition of the Duluth News Tribune. You can also find it on our website before that at DuluthNewsTribune.com. Wyatt, back to you. Thanks, Dan. Now here's a look at your forecast brought from the News Tribune's Northlandia podcast. Here's the forecast for the Duluth area on this Tuesday. Patchy fog this morning will really be the only notable weather today as high pressure building in brings us otherwise sunny skies and high temperatures this afternoon in the mid-70s. We stay clear and quiet tonight as lows cool back into the mid-50s. Shower chances return Wednesday night into Thursday morning, with perhaps a few rumbles of thunder possible at times there as well, though no heavy weather is expected at this point. Otherwise, cooler temperatures stuck in the low 70s continue through the rest of the work week. I'm Storm Tracker Meteorologist Robert Daly. Thank you to the Northlandia Podcast for their support. The bi-weekly podcast explores curious and unique stories here in the Northland. The latest episode explores an Eveleth artist who sent his work to Eleanor Roosevelt. You can find that episode and others at DuluthNewsTribune.com or where we also get this podcast. Reporting for today's episode was done by Jimmy Loverin, Peter Passy, and Jay Gabler. Thank you for listening to Duluth News Tribune Minute. Have a great day, and we'll see you back here tomorrow.